On today's episode of Locked On Canadians, the line blender may be in full effect. Your Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to episode 1166 of Locked On Canadians. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day and for subscribing on YouTube. And wherever you subscribe to podcasts, doing that supports the show and ensures you don't miss an episode. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. I am Ian Boisvert, also known as that Maybe It's Ian, and I'm joined by the incomparable Laura Saba, also known as the Active Stick. Laura, an off day for the Montreal Canadiens that felt like anything but an off day. How are we feeling at the end of it? Every time I turned around, somebody was messaging me a new tweet in the group chat. <laughs> and it's like I have multiple hockey-related group chats, and every single one of them was buzzing all day. Uh, so there was a lot to talk about. And obviously, we talked about it yesterday. The Canadians need a win, right? They need to yep. get back in the W column. So uh, it's not it's not out of the realm of possibility that there would be so many changes. Yeah, and a lot of it injury-related. We'll jump into that Um there's a lot of news to uncover from Monday's practice. We'll set up the rest of the week ahead in our weekly forecast. And then we'll drill down a little bit more and get you ready for Montreal's game against the New York Rangers on Tuesday night. So, Laura, let's start with practice. Um, lots of stuff happened. The first piece of news to come out was that, uh, as we kind of predicted in the in yesterday's episode, uh, Matheson and Slavkovsky do not practice. They had the therapy day in parentheses next to their name, which we literally said on Monday's episode would happen. Um, it was totally expected. Gooley is still day to day, did not practice dealing with an upper body injury. Um, the lines were shuffled a bit because of Slavkovsky's absence. Uh, Kirby Doc was in Slavkovsky's spot on the first line, so playing on that wing next to Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield. And the second line was Alex Newhook, uh, Oliver Kapanen centering, and Yoel Armia on the right. They asked Marty about that, and they asked him if Slavkovsky was going to be available on Tuesday, and he says he doesn't know if he'll be available on Tuesday, and even if he is available, the lines may be changed. How do we, how, why is Marty being so cryptic about this? <laughs> it seems very odd. It does, but also I, I, I kind of think that maybe he hasn't made the decision himself. It's possible, as we said, it's possible that, you know, Slavkovsky takes a lot of therapy days. Um, and there is going to be a three-day break after this Rangers game. So, you know, if we see him or not, it remains to be, you know, it is a question. But for me, like, I think the really key thing is we've seen Kirby Doc in that position before and we've liked it. Yeah. We really enjoyed that Kirby Doc experience. So I wonder if that's just something that they're doing in case Lefkowski can't go, or if he does, I wonder if it's just, you know, just kind of try to trying to keep people guessing because the problem for me is not Kirby Doc up there. The problem is what do you do with Slavkovsky in case he's ready to go? Do you play him with Kapanen? You know, that's that's the big question for me. Will they have that same chemistry? Like he really found he really hit a strike playing either alongside Kirby Doc or alongside Nick Suzuki. So now you're introducing someone else into the mix. So it's a good test for us yeah. to see, you know, what Slavkovsky's made of. But it also doesn't seem too fair to remove him off the top line because he hasn't done anything that warrants that, except for get maybe injured. Yeah, and I think all of that is is well taken. I think Marty likes to use that spot on the wing to sometimes get guys going. He did it with Josh Anderson a bunch. It was, you're going to play with the two most talented forwards on the team. We're going to get you going. I feel like that might be what's happening here if if it does come to pass that Kirby Doc is on that first line against the Rangers on Tuesday. I don't know that it would necessarily be permanent. And also, you know, there are going to be a, a, you know, two high-profile forwards joining the Canadians within the next calendar year, one of them being Patty Laine, who is going to join us hopefully around Christmas time. We did get an update on him. I'll get into that in a moment. and. Hopefully, Ivan Demidov is a Montreal Canadian next year. So, Uri Slavkovsky needs to prove that he can be Uri Slavkovsky on a different line. 
And I know that was a challenge last year because the other line that he was on was one of the worst ones we have seen the Canadians ice. But now I think he's got his mojo a little bit. I really like Oliver Kapanen a lot. Um, I think Alex Newhook has been better than his numbers have indicated. Um, so I'm, I'm totally fine with these sort of little experiments, especially when the team is in a bit of a losing streak, right? You're never going to change the lines when they're winning. Never. Coaches don't do that. Hey, you won? Great. You stay in that exact same spot tomorrow night. They're losing. They haven't won in over a week. And if they lose to the Rangers on Tuesday, their, their first chance to get a win will have been two weeks after their last one. So they need to start figuring something out. This is the time to be tinkering. You know, I think that it's totally fine to to see Uri Slavkovsky on a different line, Cole Caulfield on a different line to try to spread that offense out. It's the hottest Cole Caulfield's been since the season started. So I'm not I'm not overly concerned about the line blender being broken out. And again, it, Marty is being very cheeky and very funny because we might go, go into Tuesday and Uri Slavkovsky's playing and none of the lines are changed. So it, it, all of this could be for nothing, which is entirely possible, if not the most likely outcome. <laughs> I'm excited to see it tomorrow. Actually, I'm excited for our episode tomorrow night so we can revisit this conversation um, yeah. and see and see if Marty is, is he's doing it personally to get back at us. I think um, he's taunting us personally. I just think it's interesting because it could work. You never know like that. that there, there could be a level of chemistry there between Kapanen and Slavkovsky that is extremely exciting and enticing. I don't think necessarily he's going to move Caulfield because he's one of the only things that's working. Yeah. I mean, so, he's, yeah. yeah, he's the second, at least after Saturday's game, he was the second yeah. leading goal scorer in the NHL. The only thing that I would like to ask of Marty is to leave the lines together for a few shifts so that we can <laughs> kind of see, you know, just it didn't work for one shift. Let's just change it all back again. Cause there've been a couple of games, especially last season where every single shift was a completely different line. And it yeah. was just, it was such a mix and match that I couldn't even remember, like what, when we wanted to recap the episode, I couldn't even remember who played with who because there were yeah. so many changes. So I would just like them to see if there's some chemistry there, if they develop some chemistry. And the thing is, like, what we're asking for is a tall order. The Rangers are not an easy team to beat. We are going to yeah. get into that a little bit later in this episode, but they've got to do something. And so I'm really, really excited to see what we talk about tomorrow night after the game. Yeah. And I think the Canadians can pull their own weight in that whole, the players themselves can pull their own weight in that. If you guys want to stay on the same line, one, play well, that never, that never hurts Two, stop taking penalties. When you take penalties and the penalty kill is overtaxed, Marty has to change the lines around following those penalty kills so that He's he's not putting he's not double shifting a penalty killer. We see a lot of Franken lines coming out of penalty kills because the Canadians need to be able to ice a lineup that, you know, didn't just kill a penalty and most of the time spend full two minutes in their own zone. So the Canadians can can afford to help themselves here um, in that category. The one other piece of news that I wanted to get to from practice came from Eric Engels. Um, line A is off crutches, still wearing a knee brace, but. It seems like things are slightly progressing for him. It's you know always good to see that someone is walking under their own power. Um, do you think it's a it's a it's a boost for the Canadians to see him? You know, I think it was last year when Doc was around the team, even though we knew Doc wasn't coming back. I feel like it's a boost not only for Line A, but for the Montreal Canadiens players that are playing currently to see him. Um, you know, almost in a you know, the Simpsons, the do it for her thing, like that, that's who they're playing for is Patty Line. <laughs> I think it's really funny because I, I you know, I, you were about to say you think it's a boost for the Canadians. And I was going to say it's mostly a boost for Line, right? Yeah. Um, But I think, you know, his presence around the team, like he has this like deadpan humor. He, he just seems to have this like really fun personality, this really like interesting personality. They all were so happy when when the Canadians traded for him that I think that this is part of that. But also, I'm just I'm just happy to see that he's doing well, he's progressing well. Obviously, walking without crutches, but with a knee brace is not the same as being able to skate. And it's still a while away from being able to like, you know, skate in a in a in a contact practice jersey. So it's a, it's gonna be a while, but I think it's really it, it's fun to have that because from what I can tell, even though their play hasn't been that exciting and positive, 
the team itself doesn't seem to be wearing it on their faces. Like they don't seem to have given up. They're not wearing slump face. Yeah. No, for sure. They're, they're, they, they very much seem motivated. I know Nick Suzuki's wearing a lot of this right now, and he's saying that he needs to play better. There's not a lot of finger pointing going on in that locker room. Everybody knows they need to step it up. And again, they're looking at, they're staring down the barrel of going two weeks without a win. If you want to stay in the mix, that cannot happen. So, and we'll, we'll cover their next few opportunities to win. Uh, we'll set up the Habs three game schedule this week in our weekly forecast. And that's coming up in just a moment. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Maybe you've already got your eyes on Thursday night's matchup between the Rams and the Vikings, with Minnesota entering the game as road favorites at minus 134. Or perhaps you like Cooper Cup to find the end zone in his return at plus 125. Either way, FanDuel is the place to play. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. All right, we're back, Laura. We are going to set up the week ahead in our weekly forecast. Um, just as a reminder for those who might not have tuned in in the past, this is our weekly segment on Tuesday's episodes where we will break down the matchups um, sort of high level, provide our keys to the week and give our expectations for the week ahead for the Montreal Canadiens. So three games on the schedule, very, very oddly scheduled as the NHL loves to do. Uh, Tuesday at home against the New York Rangers. Then they don't play again until Saturday night at home against the St. Louis Blues. And then they travel to Philadelphia for a back-to-back -back against the Flyers. Uh, let's start with that game on Tuesday against the New York Rangers. Uh, Rangers last season, like you said, very, very good. 114 points, President's Trophy. I believe that was a franchise record in points for the New York Rangers. So they are literally coming off of the greatest season in team history. Not a big deal. Uh, their current record as we head into that game is 4-0-1. I believe their only loss came in overtime to the Utah Hockey Club, who have, for some reason, just had the greatest vibe since the season started and have beaten a lot of teams that maybe people wouldn't have predicted. Uh, Montreal was 1-2-0 against the Rangers last season. They had a shootout win at the Bell Center and two really, really ugly losses at Madison Square Garden. Um, what do you think is going to be the key in this matchup against the New York Rangers? We'll cover them a little bit more in depth in our final segment. But what are you what are you watching for on Tuesday night? I'm watching for discipline because I think it's too much to ask that the entire defense be revamped from one game to another. I would hope that they have a better effort on, on that front, but I think that's 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 a thing that it's going to take longer to work out. It's not just a personnel thing. It's it's, it's like the whole organization as a whole has to rethink all of that, right? From from like whoever's like bringing their skates, like ta taping their skates and sharpening, their, sorry, taping their sticks and sharpening their skates to like, you know, Jeff Gordon and Ken Hughes and, and, and Jeff Molson. Like everybody needs to worry about this defense. Uh, but when it comes to like the individual play themselves, like something the players can control is their discipline. Um, you know, and we did get a couple of comments and questions about, you know, how hard is it to be disciplined? And I think when you are always coming from behind, playing from behind, you always run the risk of playing recklessly because you have to do yeah. everything you can to get possession of the puck back, whether it's hits and that leads to, you know, potentially something that's questionable or just trying to just trying to get in people's way, right? St like a stick to the face, a trip, all of that kind of stuff, hooking, all that kind of stuff comes naturally when you are playing from behind. But I think that there's a lot of cases where we're seeing in the last few days or the last few games, I should say, where it's completely unnecessary. Like you didn't save a goal from happening. It was just lazy or, you know, you're playing tired. Just you have to keep it tighter on that front. So I, I obviously overall we need better defense on this team, but I think discipline is going to be really key against a team that is just so much better than you. There's really not that, you know. Yeah. Not, there's yeah. not that much to say. <laughs> yeah. The Rangers last season went very deep into the playoffs and were knocked out by the eventual cup champions. You know, so there's yeah. a that's a it's a very, very good team coming into the Bell Center on Tuesday. I echo your sentiment sentiment on discipline. The Rangers have the fourth best power play in the league. Thirty one percent. Montreal's penalty kill is very good over 90 percent. But that is a an elite power play coming into Montreal. So that is worrying. 
if the Canadians continue their parade to the penalty box. I don't think that they will have the same luck that they had against the Islanders on Saturday night. So that's something to watch there. Um, getting them to the, another key in our second segment on the Rangers, our third segment overall. Uh, but let's head to the matchup on Saturday night against the St. Louis Blues. Recap that last season really quick. Last season, the Blues had 92 points. Montreal went 0-2 against the Blues last year. The Canadians did not win against St. Louis. Uh, two very, very ugly losses. Uh, a 6-3 loss and a 7-2 loss. So very bad. That that cannot happen. Um, they're current, the Blues are currently 4-2-0. Um, what, what a, we don't see these Western Conference teams often. Um, I think it's only Montreal's second game against a Western Conference opponent so far. What, what are you thinking heading into that matchup against the Blues? I think for me this time around, it's don't get injured um, because I've been trying to kind of get a read on the blues for this year, obviously in preparation for this week. Uh, They seem to be a little bit more physical than the Canadians generally have to deal with. Uh, So I think it's just, it's important for me that they don't get hurt. Like I don't like the, the the Montreal Canadians and the St. Louis blues don't really have a recent history of shenanigans. It's just exactly like you said, either it is the Canadians running them out of the rink or vice versa. So I would just like to see like less injuries. I don't think, I don't think that there's, you know, just play safe. Yeah. I I think that the key to them winning against the blues on Saturday will be winning the game at five on five. The blues special teams are not very good. Uh, Power play is currently clicking at two for 13 penalty kill is four for 15. So they've given up more power play goals than they've scored. Generally not a good sign if you're an NHL team. Um, I think the special teams for the Canadians may just take care of themselves on Saturday, but they've been really, really bad at five on five. They just have not been good enough. Um, The the top line gets caved in a lot of the time. Most lines end up getting caved in. For some reason, the only line that can play up in the offensive zone seems to be that third line (laughs) of Evans, Gallagher, and Anderson. Um, Yeah. So they do need to figure that out because that's something that was a strength for them last year. Yeah, yeah. Last year it was the opposite. The, the special teams let them down, and five on five was sort of carrying them most nights. That's not that hasn't been the case so far. So you win that game if you win the game at five on five against the Blues on Saturday. I feel pretty good about their chances. Yeah. All right. We'll head into our final game here Sunday at Philadelphia. Last year, uh, eighty-seven points for the Flyers. Montreal was two zero and one against the Philadelphia Flyers last season. Currently, they are one three and one. Um, the games against Philadelphia last year were lopsided and then a shootout loss, a nine, three win, a four, one win, and a three, two shootout loss. They got five out of six points. What are you thinking here against the Flyers? I think the Flyers are a team where you can win this game. This is another one of those winnable games. They can't afford to lose, even though they will be on the second night of a back-to-back with travel. I don't think that's an excuse. You saw what the LA Kings did after getting the crap kicked out of them twice last week. And you know, in in this division and then coming in on the second night of a back-to-back with, you know, they haven't been home yet uh, this season and they were able to win that game. I don't think that necessarily it's going to be a high scoring affair, but I think the Canadians can win that game. I think they should win that game. Um, I do sense it's going to be a primo game because every Flyers game is obviously because of that history there. Um, I do think that that game is the one where I think it's the most squandered opportunity. I don't think the Flyers are going to be good this year. There were a lot of predictions saying they were going to be better than last year. And honestly, I was one of the people saying, I don't think so. I think they're going to be worse than last year. So, you know, I, I, I just don't see it as a threat. Um, I think the Canadians can, they can win it. They just, they need to not play like they did in the last three games that we've seen, particularly how they played against Pittsburgh. Yep, they can't they can't lose this one. They have they you know if the Flyers come out there with a great effort and they just beat you, tip your cap. But if the Canadians throw this one away, it's going to be another missed opportunity for them to quote stay in the mix. Couple keys for me: Uh, goaltending for the Flyers. If you get to their goalies early, I think you'll be in good shape. Both Samuel Erson and Ivan Fedotov are sub 900 goaltenders this way into the season, so not great there. And of course, contain Matt Vaymichkov. Four four games in, he's got four points already. Uh, try to not let him run the show against the Montreal Canadiens for, you know, not only the reasons within the game, but the narrative reasons are all as well will be very difficult to overcome should the Canadians, you know, allow him to put up three points. Taking the whole week in as a combined three-game schedule, 
Um, I think it's I think we see Caulfield continue his hot start. Last season against the Rangers, Blues, and Flyers combined, um, he had uh was it 20 games? No, it couldn't have been. He had he had uh 13 goals against those teams. So he's very, very good against these teams. I there's a lot of high scoring matchups here. He's he looks to be one of the key parts of those matchups. So expect Caulfield to keep rolling and hopefully the Canadians continue to roll with him. Um, all right, we'll head into our final segment. We'll drill down a little bit more on that New York Rangers matchup on Tuesday night, and we'll get into all that in just a moment. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. And that's one of the things I like the most about Indeed, the confidence that you will not only fill the position quickly, but that the candidates you are matched with will be high quality matches. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash locked on. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right. We are headed into our final segment here. We'll cover off on this matchup with the New York Rangers a little bit closer. Um, I do believe that Alexi Lafreniere will not be playing in this game for the New York Rangers. It looks like he's day-to-day -day dealing with some kind of minor injury. So a potential native kid coming home will not be able to uh, haunt the Canadians as, as often happens at the Bell Center. Uh, one of the big narratives that's surrounding the Rangers this season, though, is one of their contractual status for Igor Shosturkin, who has already turned down an eight by $11 million deal, which would have made him the highest paid goalie of all time. Uh, this seems to be headed for a really, really big number, right, Laura? I think so. And also like, I just, I just have to say we had this insanity a long time ago, maybe like a decade ago. You cannot tie up that much of your cap in one position. You can have two goalies or you can have three goalies. You cannot tie up that much of your cap in one freaking position. You get 50 contracts. You got to be careful. You get, I don't know, how many people are you on our roster? Like 22? Yeah, 22, 22 23. 22, 23. You cannot tie up that much cap in one guy. Okay. I think they're going to end up doing it, though. They have to, though. <laughs> right. That's the thing is because like. The thing is, someone is going to pay him that much, right? If the Rangers don't do it, someone will. If, mm -hmm. And and the thing is, is that these GMs, they cannot help themselves. The owners can't help themselves. They're going to do it. There's going to be a team that's going to be like, oh, I have everything but goaltending. Yeah. And they're going to do it. They're going to screw the entire market over. And I'm like, I'm honestly, I'm pro guys getting paid. Like, get yours. But yeah. it's just not a sound asset management decision. But I think it's going to be really funny. He's going to end up like making 13, 13 million a year. Yeah. And I think I'm. I think the argument on Shesterkin's side and the argument that Rangers fans are giving with paying, being comfortable paying him that amount is that it's not so much the cap hit we need to worry about moving into the future. It's the percentage of the cap because the 11 times eight that he was offered now would have been less than the percentage of the cap that Bobrovsky and Price signed for when they got their eight by tens. So potentially as the cap goes up, that maybe he gets something like 12 and a half per season. And that's still like around the percentage of the cap hit that Carey Price and Sergei Bobrovsky got. And Bobrovsky just proved right. that you can win like that. Exactly. He's the only one, but he right. did prove you can do it. <laughs> and I, I honestly, like, I think like Carey Price carried them to so many, you know, so many playoff chances to literally the Stanley Cup. He's carried the team on the, on his, on his back with that contract. Right. So I don't think the fact that he never won a Stanley Cup doesn't mean that like you can't win with that. It's just to me, like I thought it was a bad idea when they did it back then with Bobrovsky and Price. I think it's a bad idea that they're going to do it with Shosturkin now just yeah. because it's one position, right? That's the key thing. And then it's like, how much are you paying your backup? How like yeah. literally you pay this guy $12 million or 12 and a half million dollars. Like what is, what's your backup make? Then you have like $15 million tied up in cap. Even if the cap goes up to a hundred million a year it's still yeah. 
fifteen percent of your cap. It's yeah. it, it just the math doesn't math. Yeah, no, definitely. I think if you do make that deal with Shosturkin, every other contract you sign has to be below market value. Yeah, which is bad news for Alexi Lafreniere, which is bad news for potentially re-signing Panarin. It's bad news for a lot of these play Adam Fox when he comes back up again. There's a lot of really, really, really good hockey players on that team, and they're never going to have a hard time drawing free agents because they're the they Rangers. Get to play. They're the New York Rangers. You get to live in Manhattan and be a Ranger at Madison Square Garden. It's pretty cool. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm I'm less worried when teams spend that money on good players. I hate the, you know, the six million dollars that you're giving to a borderline second line player. Those are the ones that I think kill you is, you know, uh, Carl Alsner's, those contracts <laughs> kill you. The Brandon Poor Prust, <laughs> those contracts kill you because they're just bloated. They're, they're not very important part, parts of a team. I like to you call know? them Berger Van Specials. Yes, it was his favorite thing to just get. And then hardball, actually good players. <laughs> it, it made no sense. He's like, I can't pay you, Philip, to know what you're worth because I have to throw all of this money at Mike Hoffman. Yeah. Like it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, we this we are not going to make this about Mark Bergman. This is not fair <laughs> to me. I don't he sucks. <laughs> That's fine. But we're not I don't want to talk about him anymore. Um again, we'll reiterate with this matchup with the Rangers. Their power play is very good. Um they they Montreal is not going to be able to afford to take the amount of penalties that they did. And the amount of like rapid succession that they did against the Islanders. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's not a recipe for success against these Rangers. They will lose if they take that many penalties. Um, anything else we should be looking out for in that game? I think honestly, like after the the last few games that they've had, I just want to see just tighter play. Just, just, you know, tight. Yeah. Just, just, you know, I'm, I'm sounding sure like, after- like, yeah. You know, Nick Suzuki after the uh, the the LA game said it was an immature effort. Let's let's see a big boy grown up effort. That would yes. be really nice. Yes. Um, All I of also, them need to be grown ups. Yeah, I'm also kind of looking for Lane Hudson to get back to Lane Hudson. Things didn't see a ton of it against the Islanders. They did a very good job keeping him to the outside and not really letting him go to work. Now you I'd get like to see to- if he adjusts or not. Yeah, exactly. The teams have already adjusted to him. I know the Penguins came in and said that they had a game plan for a 20-year-old defenseman, which is like, wild. Hey man, they, like it's his like well, that was his like fifth, sixth game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sixth game and their yeah, game plan is for him. <laughs> yeah. And now it's up to him and the Canadians coaching staff to adjust and yeah. put him in a situation where he can uh get back to doing the things he was doing. So and that I'm, answers other questions for us. Yeah, absolutely. It answers a bunch of questions. Um, you know, the, the Canadians defense as a whole is still very concerning, but you know, we will see if that improves. All right. You want to hit up some trivia here? (laughs) I was on mute. I was so excited that I muted myself accidentally. (laughs) Um, yes, let's do trivia. I've already forgotten the answer to yesterday's question. (laughs) Yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you the question again. And we did have somebody in our comments, uh, give it to us. So in the 23-24 season, the Montreal Canadiens were perfect against six teams, meaning they took all available points from those season matchups. Name the teams, and I will give it to Christopher Colomb8238 on YouTube, who named all six teams correctly. Uh, Anaheim, they went 2-0. Columbus, they went 3-0, the only team that they beat three times and didn't lose. Chicago, 2-0. Colorado, 2-0, which is the most surprising to me. Seattle 2-0, and Winnipeg 2-0, which is also pretty surprising because Winnipeg was a decent hockey team last year. So not a ton of those sweeps. Hopefully we see maybe some more, but uh, definitely some surprises in there. Absolutely. I, I really like that question, though. It was a fun one. With these recaps, I've been just like I spend too much time on hockey reference. So that's where you get an answer like this. <laughs> um, all right. We'll go back to guessing a guy for this one. It's a Canadian and Ranger. We'll go from the New York Rangers. To Vancouver, to Montreal, to Chicago, to Philly, and back to Montreal. I think this one's an easy one. I'll give it to you again. New York Rangers, Vancouver, Montreal, Chicago, Philadelphia, and back to Montreal. If you know it, put it in the comments. We will pin the first person to get it right. And good luck. Send in questions if you got them. We've gotten a few. I haven't had the time to look through them yet, but you may see your question show up on the episode. 
Um, but this episode is all done. We're headed out of here. Thanks so much for making us your first listen of the day. For your second listen, go find Locked On Fantasy Hockey. Become a fantasy hockey expert and get the edge over your league mates with daily tips from Steel and Flip. Find Locked On Fantasy Hockey on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. As a reminder, we are free and available everywhere you get your podcasts, including YouTube. So be sure to subscribe to Locked On Canadians so you don't miss an episode. You can follow the show on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You can find us uh, on Instagram at Locked On Canadians. You can email us at LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com. You can find Laura at The Actor Stick. You can find me at Maybe It's Ian. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.